So good evening and welcome to the 335th meeting of the New York Comics and Picture Stories Symposium. This is a weekly lecture series on comics, illustration, animation, and the history of text and image work. The series is sponsored in part by the Will and Ann Eisner Family Foundation. And our guest tonight is Simone Chess, uh, an associate professor of English and director of gender, sexuality, and women's studies at Wayne State University in Detroit, which you can see out the window. Um, she is the author of Male to Female, Cross-Dressing in Early Modern English Literature, Gender Performance and Queer Relations from Rutledge in 2016, and co-editor with Will Fisher and Colby Gordon of a special issue of Early Modern Trans Studies in the Journal for Early Modern Cultural Studies in 2019. She's completing a book on Shakespeare and trans culture for Rutledge uh, for their Spotlight on Shakespeare series and another book project about early modern disability, queerness and technology, the technologies of sex. And her talk tonight is entitled Broadside Ballad Woodcuts, Pre-Modern Visual Culture, Popular Media and Queer Coding. And I was just mentioning to Simone that I don't think we've had anybody speak specifically about um, ballad sheets, illustrated ballad sheets, but it's kind of a key part of the history of uh, text and image storytelling. And uh, so this, this is, we're really looking forward to this. So thanks for coming. So, and take it away, Simone. Thanks so much, Ben. I wanna thank you for this invitation, which was truly shocking. I don't consider myself an expert in broadside ballad woodcuts. And so this invitation was really a provocation for me to think about a topic that I've worked on variously, kind of on the side or as a tangent in other projects and to see if I could bring it to, together into kind of a coherent whole. And I would say, mixed results. I'm still working on it. So I really look forward to seeing what all of you think. And I want to thank you for being here on a Tuesday night. Uh, I appreciate your patience as I stretch a little beyond my expertise as a non-artist and non-art historian to talk and think about these images with you. So broadside ballads were a massively popular cheap media that were printed, distributed, and widely available in English from the late 16th into the earliest 20th centuries. Broadsides were generally printed on a single sheet and usually contained the text of a song, a reference to a popular tune to which the song could be sung, illustrations, um, and these illustrations were generally printed from woodblock cuts. As material objects, uh, sorry, woodcut blocks. As material objects, broadside ballads would have been omnipresent in early modern English culture. They were sold by ballad hawkers on the streets who would have sung snippets of the songs as part of the sale. They were displayed decoratively in homes and public spaces like alehouses, and they were used and reused as scrap paper to wrap food, even as toilet paper. So you literally would have seen ballad broadsides everywhere you went as ephemera. Often compared to modern tabloids, ballads covered a range of themes from religion to politics to current events to gossip and what we might call fake news. It's estimated that literally millions of broadside sheets were printed and sold during their heyday, and while most were ephemeral and are no longer extant, many thousands still exist and have, over the last two decades, suddenly become a much more accessible resource through digitization and online archiving and cataloging. The illustrations used in broadside ballads were generally woodcuts made through relief printing with an image carved in fine grain wood and then set alongside the typeset text in the printing press. So this is really the cheapest way to include images in early modern printing. Nevertheless, woodcuts were expensive to make 
so it was cheaper to save and reuse them. So woodcuts would have been occasionally made specifically to illustrate a particular ballad. And here's an example of a fairly specific one with lots of detail matching the text. So this is the lamentable ballad of the tragical end of a gallant lord and virtuous lady. It's a really important ballad for thinking about um, race making in the early modern period. And you can see here a character described as a blackamoor who has taken hostage a white woman and he ha has one of her children by the foot and the other is being thrown off the edge as her husband begs for mercy, the husband having enslaved this black man. So this is a very specific woodcut that would have been made specifically for this kind of story. Um, However, most were commonly printed from an existing stock of woodcuts with or without variation. And so a more common looking ballad is something like this one, the Kentish Dick. And you can see that the printer just picked an assortment of ballads and kind of designed them around decoratively on the, alongside the text. Uh, what I want to talk about today is the possibility that certain woodcuts might have had iterative lives of increasing meaning through reproduction and reuse, particularly when it came to signaling and advertising queer and non-normative sexualities, sex practices, and gender formations. In looking for a kind of iconography or visual vocabulary encoded in broadside ballad woodcuts, I'm not entirely alone. Here's a little citation shout out section. Early scholarship of ballads tended to give only cursory and dismissive discussion of woodcuts. The go-to keyword for describing these images is crude, and scholars often express dismissal or even frustration over what seems to them like random placement of images with text, describing the graphic elements of broadsides as incongruent, having, quote, little actual illustrative function, and even as creating, quote, inappropriate, almost surrealist effects. But at the same time, there's been increasing attention to what, if anything, the woodcuts included in ballads might be doing there. Making a case for religious rhetoric of the ballads, Tessa Watt read woodcuts as forms of what she calls popular piety that relocated sacred imagery from medieval Catholic churches to print after the Protestant Reformation. Alexandra Franken, Frank. Glenn has argued that ballad woodcuts like the ones pictured here had a collage function that accumulated reflective narrative and associative um, meanings as they move between texts. While Theodore Barrow sees them as having what he calls a shifting role in meaning making, more like a reconfigurable vi visual language kit that could be dis and reassembled to create custom pictorial meanings out of set parts for each new use, kind of like, I guess, emoticons. Patty Fummerton argues that the disconnection between the varied images that are often arranged together uses the layout of the full broadside to send a message about isolation, vagrancy, and what she calls an aesthetics of displacement. The scholar Christopher Marsh has compellingly studied the recurrence of certain recognizable characters and postures from one ballad to the next to argue for associative intertextual meanings generated through that repetition. For instance, this figure, called the Howdy Do Man, who appears in more than 100 extant ballads. And um, Marsh talks about his posture, that open hand, and finds that the Howdy Do Man pretty much only shows up in cheerful ballads, for example. Meanwhile, the scholar Katie Cisneros has called ballad woodcuts early modern memes in which the ballads and their images were part of what she calls a, quote, anthology of cultural knowledge that had its parts drawing upon and from within each other to create meaning, just like modern memes. So here from Cisneros's article is an image of two lovers and they have this fillable speech bubble that different ballads would fill in with different speech or leave empty. And she's comparing it to a meme like this with sort of spaces where you would fill in text based on the meaning you wanted to convey. So how does any of this have to do with queerness, gender, or sexuality? I'll try to unpack this idea tonight in three parts. So first, repeating a single woodcut, similar to um, the howdy do man phenomenon, such that the repetition generates a queer meaning. This section begins with an example that I observed anecdotally in my research on early modern trans studies that's been enhanced by new digital search technologies. Most of the ballads I'm showing you today are from the UC Santa Barbara English Broadside Ballad Archive, which catalogs nearly 10,000 digitized 16th, 17th, and early 18th century broadside ballads made searchable through transcription, keywording, and a woodcut search tool. 
when I was working on my dissertation, which became my first book, which was about what I'd now call trans feminine characters, those assigned male at birth, but dressing and living as women in their textual worlds. I used Ebba to locate this ballad, Sport Upon Sport, or the man in the S dash, but I think it's meant to be the man in the skirt. This ballad is both body and queer, describing what it calls, quote, a true relation of a pleasant fellow that in the attire of a woman lay with several maids and got them with child. What was interesting to me then was that this main character, whose name is only given as Kate, is described as passing their time in a gown and petticoat, and their seduction of country lasses includes spending time with them in a girlish sleepover mode, talking about, quote, maidens' blisses and their maiden heads before ultimately seducing them, still evidently in feminine attire. But as I worked on the ballad, I was bothered by the main woodcut, which pretty clearly, or at least to me, it seemed pretty clearly, shows a man and a woman, not two women or two seeming women in bed together. It seemed to me initially that the woodcut undermined the queerness and trans potential of sport upon sport, straightening it out into a heterosexual affair. But then I started seeing this woodcut over and over again in my various searches for queer, erotic, and otherwise sexually non-normative ballads. So I used the Ebba search tool to look for more of its cataloged uses, oops, and found 39 variations of the woodcut. And these, there are certainly more out there as the catalog and cataloging system expands. So at least 39 variations on the woodcut, although some are different printings of the same ballad. Among these, there are some that seem more or less like standard body ballad content involving what appears at least to be heterosexual sex, mostly out of marriage, so that's a little scandalous, with various outcomes. In The Unfortunate Damsel, for example, a maid seeking a husband woos a gardener's apprentice, even though he's unavailable for marriage due to his indentureship to his master and mistress. In love or in lust, the maid assures him, never think upon indentures. You see, I am a lusty lass, both handsome, brisk, and airy. Therefore, we will embrace a while and afterwards will marry. The gardener takes her to his garden where they, quote, did a thing which I blush to give you a relation, thus ruining her name and fame and staining her reputation before he eventually forsakes her and she is forced to enter service herself. In The Hasty Bridegroom, the woodcut is used to depict a happy ma marriage, albeit somewhat porno pornographically, with an unusual verse form depicting a bride and groom on their wedding night, him asking her to, quote, feel with your hand how you make me to stand, and her replying uh, that he should, quote, take thy fill, do thy will, use thy skill, welcome still. And um, in the conclusion, they, quote, make sports by themselves all alone, being placed and unlaced, he uncased, she embraced, then he stoutly made bold with his own. I'd even extend the umbrella of what I'm calling standard or straight body ballads with this woodcut to include the London cuckold, which describes a husband who literally grows cuckold horns after his wife sleeps with another man and becomes pregnant with that man's child. Or here's another one, the London lass's folly, where a woman is raped and doesn't know the identity or nationality of her baby's father. While these latter two depict traumatic or non-ideal situations, they fit the body ballad tradition of at once describing a salacious scene or situation and purporting, at least nominally, to advise the reader against finding themselves in that same situation. So you get the pornography and then you also get a kind of gentle warning not to end up in that same position. These uses of the woodcut seem to use it more or less in the straightforward, which is to say straight, way that I was worried it was working in sport upon sport. But things take a turn in actually a majority of the other ballads that use this woodcut in an array of atypical situations that seem to me to make a solid case for this image coming to mean something beyond its surface suggestion of general sexual content. The theme of the London cuckold is reimagined in the ballad, The Contented Cuckold or The Fortunate Fumbler, where instead of a cuckoldry situation being caused by a wife's lasciviousness, it's instead a consensual arrangement suggested by the husband due to his own impotence. In this ballad, a new husband is offered 500 pounds above his wife's dowry at the birth of their first child. But after seven years of marriage, he remains unable to consummate the relationship. 
Interestingly, the ballad describes a loving, even sexual relationship in which the husband strokes, kisses, and sweet talks his wife, tells her that he is, quote, not unwilling, but he's nevertheless unable to perform penetrative reproductive sex. To soothe his wife and secure the remainder of her inheritance, he suggests that they make an arrangement with a, quote, lusty lad who lives at the mill, a man of, quote, much practice and skill, who can grant the wife's desire and give them a son. The ballad concludes with the husband content to be a cuckold by his own design, promising what he sows, I do reckon to, to reap. Sweet wife, let the time be appointed, and he in private shall come then, though you lie often together. There is no creature alive need to know, but that I am still the right father. In this ballad, the woodcut could represent either the fumbling husband or the skillful neighbor. Either way, though, the ballad opens up queer possibilities, including non-sexual or asexual romance, consensual non-monogamy, what we might call pre-modern sperm donation or gamete donation, and non-genetic kinship. Impotence is a theme, again, in... I went too far, in The Sorrowful Bride or The London Lass's Lamentation for Her Husband's Insufficiency, which is spoken in the voice of a wife who reports that she has, quote, now been married a 12 month and more, and here's a sorrow that troubles me sore as having my maidenhead now to this day. Is this not enough to make me run astray? She exclaims in the chorus, alas, I am almost a weary of life for to live a maiden though a married wife. As the ballad continues, the wife describes a husband who's large and strong, only 21 years old, gives her riches and houses, land and jewelry, but despite her beauty and her efforts, he, quote, lies like a log or a stone in my bed. In this context, the woodcut shows that the action shows the action that is not happening or that the wife wishes would happen, but perhaps it also signals this additional queer iteration of a marriage that looks normative on the outside but is queer in the bedroom through the mismatch of an asexual or disinterested husband and a desirous but loyal wife. Where the sorrowful wife depicts the wife's efforts to induce a sexual response from her husband, Dick the plowman turned doctor for the or the lovesick maiden cured, presents sex as a medical treatment in its own right in a narrative about the early modern diagnosis of green sickness, which was understood to plague young women with a surplus of desire without an outlet and which could have been only cured by sex. The ballad playfully reports that its subject, a maiden named Bess, was very sick, very, very, very sick, sick indeed, but pray for what? Oh, for something Dick has got. Bess tells the plowman Dick, and yes, both plowman and Dick are intentional puns, uh, <clears throat> for my grievous malady, you can cure immediately. Then pray now, Richard, give me that. I need not name it. You know what? And finally, after some back and forth, when they had, quote, understood each other, Dick for joy did leave his plow, gave his whip unto his brother, and swore he'd cure her now. Then unto her straight he goes, and his skill to her he shows, brisk and blithe she then became, and any, as anyone upon the plain. The ballad then concludes, now maids, you see what Dick can do, then try if he can cure you too. In contrast with some of the more normative ballads using this woodcut then, this ballad ends not with a pat didactic message about chastity or a caution, but with a provocation for pleasurable non-reproductive extramarital sex while also modeling female sexual desire as healthy, curative even, and unpunished. And here's another one with a frank and joyful sexual pleasure outside of norms. In the West Country Wonder, a quote, ancient lady of almost 67 years of age, a widow, decides to marry her servant Will, who's much younger at scarce twice 11. Despite his youth and her age, they have a joyful match and he, quote, proved himself a man of skill when she becomes pregnant despite her age. Pleased with his performance, the lady makes Will, quote, the lord of all her land, uh, which kindness to requite, he yields her the delight of pleasant joys at night. The ballad concludes not only with celebration of this unusual love match and miraculous pregnancy, but with a dig at the society that might judge the couple, announcing, since the deed is done, if it should prove a son, we shall great triumph see, for lords of high degree will let his christening be. The we here who will triumph includes the ballad's audience among those who will celebrate when the old guard of lords have to attend the christening of the noble son of a 22-year-old servant, 
suggesting that the woodcut signals not just that this is another fun sex ballad, but that it might have a market among cultural outsiders who root for what I'd call the weirdos. Frank sexual desire outside of marital norms is also explored in the ballad Sweet William's Kindness or the Hertfordshire's Frolic, which describes the hypersexual exploits of, quote, one sweet William, a brisk young lad who tickled the girls till he made them mad. This ballad takes place in an alehouse where over the course of an evening, William has public sex against the wall with a sequence of willing women, each in view of the others. When William is, quote, jumbling against the wall with Hannah, quote, it filled the others with warm desire, their hearts lit, then burnt like flames of fire, but he promised to please them all, and so he did against the wall. The ballad describes less the sex itself than the fact that others the fact of the others watching the sex. Molly watching William and Hannah, Betty watching William and Molly, an old woman peeping through the door who, quote, saw more than she ever saw before. And upon seeing all these lovers, uh, so brisk, so brave, so free, the old woman grows wanton herself and, quote, vowed if she were young again, that pretty sport, she'd never refrain. Here again, there's no real didactic message. The ballad ends with an invitation to any maids living near Hertfordshire who, uh, if they hear about William and are in want, can come to him for a cure. And he'll, quote, give you ease immediately. In Sweet Ballad, in Sweet William, as with The Sorrowful Bride, the woodcut again seems out of sync with the ballad's erotic content. The chorus here reminds us again and again that William is having sex right there in the pub against the wall, not in a bed, and in front of a crowd, not alone. So again, while it's possible that this is a stock image letting readers know that this is just a sexy ballad disregarding the specifics of the sex, it's also possible that through intertextual connections with all of these other non-normative affiliations, the image signals not just something sexual, but something queer or perverse, in this case public sex, the implication maybe of group sex or the enactment of a sex scene, and also the possibility of polyamory. But wait, there's more. The last few instances of this woodcut's use bring us even closer to the trans or cross-dressing ballad, Sport Upon Sport, that started my thinking about this image in the first place. In the ballad News from Hyde Park, the author anticipates Jonathan Swift's poem, The Ladies' Dressing Room, and other grotesque misogynistic poetry by detailing the private undressing of a sex worker, revealing that her beauty has always been a complex illusion. In the ballad, a country gentleman, the speaker, conducts a lady of pleasure home to her house, where she invites him to enter her private chamber. When she goes into her dressing closet, the gentleman peeps in the keyhole to see what she did. From this vantage, he witnesses in shock as she, quote, took off her head attire and showed her bald pate. Her bald pate did show like an ostrich's head. And then, he says, the more I did peep, the more I did spy, which unto amazement drove me. She put her finger, put up her finger and dropped out her eye. I pray that some power would relieve me. Now bald and one-eyed, the lady further fetched a yawn and out fell her teeth. This queen had an intent to deceive me, says the watcher. And then she takes out a handkerchief to wipe her forehead and drops off her nose, which makes the man run quickly and put on his hose. This is a sign of advanced syphilitic disease. Then finally, she washes all the paint from her visage, revealing herself in total to be as ugly as a witch. In the end, the country gentleman does flee, shocked, and he vows to stick to fresh, fresh air and country women over city whores in the future. Again, the woodcut is in odds with the action here, showing an amorous embrace where really the opposite happens in the narrative. But if the image puts this ballad in conversation with sport upon sport, the misogyny and fear that accompany the idea of a sexual partner pretending to be someone they aren't is a troubling, troubling counterpoint to my otherwise queerly optimistic reading of the character Kate, who passes for someone they aren't with a disguise less gross, but no less misleading than this gallant lady from the park. Note too here the tune of the crossed couple, which also evokes this theme of mistaken identity and disguise. In this context, the woodcut signals perversity, but in a less fun, irreverent, suggestive of a community of queers kind of way, and more with a reminder of the judgment and risk associated with passing, pretending, and undermining gender and sexual norms. With this in mind, then, I'll turn to one final iteration of the couple in bed woodcut, here in the ballad Cheat Upon Cheat, or The Debauched Hypocrite. 
This one comes nearly full circle to the boy in a skirt theme of Sport Upon Sport with the story of two assigned female characters who marry when one is disguised as a man. As the ballad recounts, Susan strangely was disguised. Sarah's heart was soon surprised so that she did condescend. She never denied to be a bride, but her young lover, and this is the young lover who turns out to be Susan in disguise, did commend. The ballad continues, while her joys were thus completed, Sarah was extremely cheated, which did make her vitals fail. To bed they went with joint consent and she found a cat without a tail. What a weird ballad. The narrator explains, quote, with sword and wig was Susan dressed. Sarah thought that she was blessed with a gallant none more fair, but pity twas a wanton lass should so much mistaken there. The ballad ends in an upsetting way with Sarah lamenting over having been so tricked. She asks, why would you abuse one whom you love, deceitful Susan? Why would you thus me betray? And Susan answers, "'Twas a jollitry that, thus, that made me thus the antic play. Let no one know how you mistake, mistrayed, how mistaken when you married, for twill make the world to laugh. You walked your round and then you found a constable without a staff." The ballad concludes with a surprising warning to all maids who might apparently be in danger of also marrying their friends disguised as men. To all maids, let this be a warning. All are wise that still are learning. Beauty is a mere decoy. Then have a care lest Cupid's snare do make you curse the blinking boy. I have to believe that this warning really only applies to a very select crew of ladies and that instead the ballad's yet another vehicle for describing queer orientation to an audience that's at once judgmental and possibly desirous of it. The woodcut here continues to do its work of signaling something Maybe Susan and Sarah in bed with Susan disguised, or maybe Susan and Sarah overlaid or imprinted with the residue of Kate, the boy in a skirt, and the maiden on their sleepover, inflected with sweet William, the contented cuckold, and the sorrowful bride, and all those others whose complex sexual proclivities and practices are somehow hovering alongside this woodcut, so that where one reader might see nothing in particular beyond its surface depiction, another might see a queer-coded signal. I'll, set, I'll end this section with one last clue to how this might have worked with yet another gender disguised sex ballad, this one called The Male and Female Husband. This ballad tells the story of a midwife who assists at the birth of a baby who we would today call intersex, whom the midwife names Mary Jewett and raises as a daughter li who lives as a woman. Um, and raises as a daughter, sorry. Living as a woman, Mary Jewett assists her adoptive mother with the feminine uh, skills of midwifery. But after years of female life, the now adult Mary Jewett grows lusty, sleeps with a woman, and quote, its male instruments so used, the wench proved great with child. At which point Mary confesses to their mother that quote, he had male parts as well as female twixt the thighs. At the ballad's conclusion, a justice of the law is brought to adjudicate the case, conducts an anatomical exam, and declares, for since the wench was got with child, they both must marry be, to which the hermaphrodite did give his free consent, and changing habit for a man, he to the church straight went. I love this ballad for its frank discussion of, intersex, of an intersex young adult making discoveries about their body and desires and ultimately, however much this is a fantasy more than a true news report, being accepted in the gender of his choice by his community and even by the ballad which adopts male pronouns. And if I was an early modern reader looking out for a ballad that might offer me this kind of queer affirming or at least queer imagining kind of text, I might notice that its publisher had marked it with an approximation of the woodcut we've been talking about so far tonight, a different image, this woodcut to the far left. Uh, a different image than the one we of, from the single woodcut I've talked about so far tonight, but one that evokes that first one, perhaps putting the male and female husband in conversation and circulation with sport upon sport and cheat upon cheat and the others. Okay, phew. these next few sections are a little bit shorter than that one. Uh, part two. <clears throat> the way that the last images of a couple in bed echoes, but doesn't directly reuse the same woodcut, brings me to the second way in which woodcuts seem to have been used to suggest queer content by evoking without directly reusing certain visual cues or signs. 
Over the last few years, I was the project manager on a small offshoot of the English Broadside Ballad Archive, working with my graduate students to create a much less fancy but still functional and searchable database of 113 ballads that had been cataloged by Professor Diane Dugau under the broad umbrella category she called warrior women ballads. In each of the 113 ballads, a person assigned female at birth considers or actually undertakes disguising themselves as a male soldier or sailor, often in pursuit of a male love interest. These ballads, like some of the others I've been discussing tonight, are rich texts full of complex gendered identities and embodiments, and my students and I enjoyed working through those narrative elements as we designed ways to make the collection searchable and sortable through keywords and categories. But one area where I felt our work fell short was in thinking about the woodcut images that accompanied these warrior women texts, most of which felt to me initially sort of anonymous, mostly stock images of soldiers and then collaged editions of male or female figures that felt only vaguely connected to the characters in the narrative. In this example from the ballad, The Female Warrior, which we used as the header for our website, I wasn't sure how to read this line of soldiers. Is one of them the female warrior, a quote, woman in man's attire who quote, got an ensign's place and then served with valor until being discovered upon going into labor? Or is the female warrior meant to be evoked by the female figure in the second part of the sheet, who seems to me awfully femme for this character, but does appear to be drumming a job undertaken by several of the so-called warrior women. Or maybe it's both somehow, or even a third thing, why we use this image on the website was in a sort of imagining that this lineup of soldiers was all warrior women. Uh, what helped me to understand the queer visual vocabulary of the warrior women ballads was less the reuse of any one image and more a connection between these particular ballads images and other cheap print woodcuts in circulation around the same time that were explicit about showing queer gender. These aren't ballads, but you can see similarities in design. They're also printed for popular use with the woodcuts very much part of that marketing. What you see here are two pamphlets, both published in 1629, one entitled Hic Mulier, or the Man Woman, and the other Hic Weir, or the, man, or the Womanish Man. And these are Latin grammar jokes with the masculine pronoun Hic connected to Mulier, or woman, and the feminine Hic connected to Vir, or man. The parodic pamphlets lament the lax gender norms of the period, and it's funny how very much they sound like similar uh, political lamentations today suggesting that male effeminacy and fashion has caused female masculinity and aggression and vice versa. You'll notice that the masculine woman in particular is signaled by her boots, her spurs, her large hat with a feather and her weapon. This butch or transgender or gender transgressive iconography is echoed fairly directly in the woodcuts accompanying the 1611 play, The Roaring Girl, which staged the so-called real events from the life of a London persona, the gender transgressive criminal celebrity, Mary or Mal Cut person. Here's some other images, mostly 18th century images, in addition to the 1611 woodcut depicting Mal Cut purse. With this queer visual vocabulary in mind, now look at the warrior woman ballad entitled The Gallant She Soldier, another ballad in which, as the subtitle describes it, a quote, faithful hearted woman, quote, attired herself in man's apparel and so became a soldier and marched along with her love through Ireland, France, and Spain, and never was known to be a woman until at the last she brought forth a gallant man child to the wonder of all her fellow soldiers. And I should note here that it's actually relatively rare in the genre of ballads for the, for the warrior women to give birth while serving as servants, but those are a special interest of mine. And that's why I've pulled these examples. I'm happy to discuss them further if anyone's interested later. As you can see though, in these images, the figures with boots, studs, large feathered hats and swords do look like men, right? If you didn't know anything about this visual vocabulary, that's what you might think, but they also look very much like Mal Cutpurse and Hic Mulier. Or here's another one, just a single woodcut that I pulled from a ballad, uh, The Faithful Lover's Farewell, which seems to use those same signs of queerness while adding what looks to me to be a provocative lifting of a skirt, or maybe it's just the person's cloak. Whether they're using stock woodcuts designed to be men or special cuts purpose made to give these signals, the publishers of the Warrior Women Ballad seem to be tapping into a pre-existing and already circulating set of codes for female or trans masculinity so that the ballads, like their main characters, can pass in some context and be revealed in others. This use of 
evocation and insider knowledge is can be seen by some that can be seen by some audiences, but not others seems to me particularly a part of queer culture and queer history making. In a different project that I'm working on now, I've been reading through the archives of transgender periodicals from the 1950s through 1980s, looking for references to early modern studies. One of my favorite finds involves a queer coded woodcut that is queer not only through context and evocation, much like these warrior, uh, that's queer only through context and evocation, much like the warrior women images. Here, in a way ahead of her times article about the queer lives of some of the so-called boy actors who played early modern female roles on the stage, Drag Magazine, uh, um, the author Laura McAllister's point is emphasized by Drag Magazine's layout, which works to draw a connection between early modern actors and modern trans people, even at the lay level of layout. This is, to my knowledge, the only time an early modern woodcut was printed in Drag Magazine. In the caption for the image, the author Laura McAllister writes, quote, boy actor in an Elizabethan play, probably the Spanish tragedy by Thomas Kidd. The best known boy actor of the time was Nathaniel Field, and this may be he. The urge to include a picture of an actor actress, in addition to the illustration um, on the first page of the article, again connects it to the more unusual format and structure of the magazine. On the facing page, a photo story called Here, There, and Everywhere, Where the Girls Are, shows six images of various glamorous femmes with captions that just like McAllister's about kid, mostly guess at who might be in the image, like blonde beauty, unidentified. Um, even in the modern images, identities are mysterious and hard to fix. There's familiarity and nicknames, but also a sense of unknowability and, and anonymity, passing and not passing. In the figure of the woodcut, kid or a different actor actress or the artist's rendition of an imagined cis woman in the role are all possibilities. Are the, pic are the women pictured, similarly, the women pictured could be drag performers or trans women, members of the community or one-time visitors, potential friends or permanent strangers. In writing about boy actors as ancestors to drag queens and trans women in a venue for those communities, McAllister brings academic and historical knowledge, knowledge through her woodcut, but presents it alongside the queer present. The image, which doesn't look particularly queer on its own, does evocative work through context to bring all of these ideas and hopes and histories together. Now, to conclude in the same vein of taking woodcuts far beyond their original purposes and in doing so potentially generating queer meaning, here's my part three, remixing woodcuts. The ballad, A New Game of Cards, has a narrative about a game of cards played between three cheaters, one English, one Irish, and one Scottish, with the life of the king, here meaning the winning card and also a reference to the king of England, at stake. The ballad is accompanied by the strange image of one man being controlled by a black devil with his puppeted actions affecting the large group of men who stand beside him holding up the globe. This image is already sort of sampled in, th in this, its first context where I can find it, but it gets remixed in multiple ways over the course of its use and reuse in other ballads. Here, for example, it shows up in a song for all penitent singers with the devil completely excised. So here you can see they've just cut off one edge of the woodcut and you have only the men holding up the globe as part of this ballad's um, visual vocabulary. And then in the ballad, The Bad Husband's Return from His Folly, and once again in Strange and True News from Westmoreland, we see only the devil and the man without the globe and the uh, crowd around it, in both cases being used to describe husbands mistreating their wives. Stripped of its original context of international politics and card playing, the devil with man puppet woodcut evolves to teach lessons about spousal responsibility and gender roles. In this second one, the husband, Gabriel Harding, comes home drunk and, quote, struck his wife a blow on the breast and killed her outright, and then denied the same. His lie is revealed when an actual angel visits Harding's house, sentences Harding to death, and then banishes Satan, who, after he ex then banishes Satan after Satan executes Harding because of Satan's roles in the man, role in the man's actions. This heavy use of the image sets the stage for one further remix evident in the ballad, The Unnatural Wife, which tells the, uh, um, the true crime story of Anne Davis, who allegedly murdered her husband after surviving his drunken abuse. 
Here, as you can see, the woodcut is redone to show a woman, a wife, as the one in the devil's grasp. And thus the story of gendered violence is put in direct connection alongside matters of male criminality and even treason. So the reason that Anne is burned at the stake, which you can see in the second part of the ballad, uh, rather than hanged for her murder of her husband, is because in under early modern English law, murdering one's husband was uh, the same or analogous to murdering the king only on a domestic scale, and therefore it counted as a form of treason. Anne Davis's murder ballad thus closes a circle to the original use of the woodcut in a ballad about unseating the king and upsetting the globe through cheating and satanic intervention. I'm sorry, I gotta fix my, uh, my mouse just stopped working for a second. One second to make this work again, nope. Sorry, I'm having trouble moving my document and can only move. Give me one more second. I'm just gonna stop screen sharing for a second to try to get this to work. Huh, nothing is working. Give me one more second. Sorry, this is really unusual. Oh, my mouse seems to have stopped functioning. So I'm going to uh, move away from my script and use, oh, now it won't even work. I'm gonna just uh, move away from my script and use, um, seeing something in the chat, I can't see the chat either. I will just use the PowerPoint to talk you through the remainder of my remarks. Uh, go back and find them. Okay, so here's Ann Davis and her treason um, is amplified by connecting what appears to be a female crime, um, the wife killing her husband, um, through its connection to husbands killing their wives with the same imagery, and to the original context of treason and cheating in cards. So I would have said this more artfully, but all of this makes me wonder what else can we do with an emerging queer vocabulary where we can see the repetition, the reappropriation and the remixing of different kinds of ballad imagery, of woodcut images, um, being put to use evoking queer understandings for, for certain types of readers. And so um, where I went at the end of this was to a set of images, not from woodcuts, all describing um, the Count of Gondomar, who was a Spanish ambassador to England during this time period, during the Jacobean court. And he was involved in trying to set up the son of King James, Prince Charles, with um, with uh, the Infanta of Spain in, in a political marriage, but he was wildly unpopular and he was known for what was called his famous anal fistula. And so um, one way that I think we could use the queer coding that I've been trying to articulate that we can learn through ballad woodcuts is in interpreting these engraved images that were used in different depictions of Gondomar in popular culture during his lifetime. So here is a formal engraved portrait of Gondomar. You can see his dress and his, uh, his sort of general appearance. And therefore you can recognize him in the play, A Game at Chess, where he was satirized in the character of the Black Knight, who was a scheming character who undermined the sort of court of the white court, which represented England. And so in this image, you see Gondomar as the Black Knight, and you can recognize him in part because of his signature outfit. There's his hat, now it's on his head. Behind him in a sack, you see the losing characters in that game of chess uh, depicted all together in their bag. So from there, I would look at a second title page of the same play, A Game at Chess, which zooms in on these characters and does more work to queer code and um, racially code the character of Gondomar. Here you see his skin has been darkened, racializing his Spanish ethnicity. And this bag has gotten bigger and more gaping, perhaps I would argue, evoking this anal fistula for which he was so famous so that the characters whom he tricks end up not only going 
to quote unquote hell in the game of chess, but also being sucked into his capacious anal cavity, which was coded as queer and disabled, right? And also grotesque. This is the title page of the second part of Vox Populi, which once again depicts Gondomar, and now we're used to recognizing him through this visual vocabulary, but now includes two of his most famous um, accessories, his chair of ease, which he sat on for comfort because of his fistula, and this was a um, a carriage that he was carried in because it was difficult for him to walk also because of the fistula. And so here you see the same man, the same set of ideas amplified once again with that anal openness represented by the chair. Now the chair also looks like a birthing stool. And so finally in the last iteration, we see this, um, this engraving remixed yet again. This is now no longer meant to be about Gondomar, but it still evokes him both in the racialization and in the discussion of anality because here the chair becomes not just a birthing stool, but a nest. So this is an anti-Dutch pamphlet about um, Doris Law's ghost. And here, the risk of the Dutch is that they might lay their eggs in England, um, propagating their culture instead of English culture. And so the existing visual vocabulary of Gondomar gets repurposed in this queer way to talk about the Dutch. So what I would have said in the conclusion of what would have been a much more articulate closing of my talk was that, um, was that um, what the ballads teach us to do is make these loose associations, what I call impressions, right? Just like there's an impression made by printmaking of a woodcut ballad that open up all kinds of um, possibilities for interrelation and cross-textual understanding that allows for queer possibility, cross-racial possibility, um, and other ways of reading both modern and early modern sexuality, gender, and identity into woodcut images. So I think I'm gonna stop there because I'm without my script and my computer. I'm worried the whole computer will shut down if I try to fix anything further, but I hope you'll have questions that can help me bring up what would have been my very brilliant ideas and that together we can talk more about broadside ballad culture, the visual culture of the early modern, and the ways that we might see a queer vocabulary emerging in some of these images. Thank you so much. And thanks for putting up with my technical fail. Now, I don't, I, I cannot even stop my screen share. I'm not sure Ben, um, as, as co-host, you're oh, able to do that. Maybe I can, hold on. I'm very nervous to do too much because I'm, I'm worried I'll just disappear. Um, and relatedly, I also cannot see the, the chat. So if that is a question in the chat, you'll have to ask me uh, verbally. I guess it's the Tuesday night curse. I, my computer was working fine, but now I'm very scared. I don't want to drop out of the call. Yeah, I'm having trouble doing that too, for some reason. But let me move you up to a gallery so we can see other people. Um, we can leave, I guess we can leave it up and see everything. Yeah, all right. Um, well, maybe I'll go back to a more appealing whoops. image. There we go. Okay, what should we do? Nope, it stopped. So I don't know if anybody has any questions or comments. Um, what, one component of this um, ballad uh, sheet culture is that there were performers with um, more elaborate painted uh, board, they called them board workers. And they would sell, they would, they would do the, their performance to the board, the painted board, and then sell this sort of cheap version of the print so and that's i don't know that there's much left of that physically you know the material uh, evidence other than people talked about it and described yeah. it but um so that's it was a pretty complex kind of street performance yes uh, at certain levels you know uh but, yeah, um, a lot of what we don't know about sort of what circulated with these ballads is how they might have been put into context by the hawkers who sold yeah. them, which ballads might the hawkers have set. So you have certain printers specializing in certain types of material, certain kinds of images that they like and think their audiences would like. And then you have these sellers who are different from the printers who are making selections based on what they think their audiences will like, and then they're performing them or at least tidbits of them, so that you would know the tune in order to sing it yourself or to, to yeah. learn. So 
using it. Uh, and they're using visual media, like you're talking about either larger woodcut images or painting yeah. Yeah. part of the sale too. So it's very multimedia and that gives me, I think, a little bit of license to, to make an argument for these kinds of associations because we know for sure that there was this kind of like overlapping culture. The ballads were circulating so wildly and freely among different communities and in different ways that I think things like this were possible, not maybe in the anachronistic terms that I'm using, but nevertheless, that these kind of, kind of connective and associative things were very much available. Yeah, and they, they uh, from Samuel uh, Pepys, you know, one of the big collectors, we know these things moved across all classes. And um, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that's a whole nother aspect yeah, I mean, of how different you, people read these, different classes read these things. But yeah, if you um, visit the early the English the early English broadside ballad archive website that I use for a lot of these sources one interesting way that they um that they de display the ballads is you can look at them as a facsimile image of the ballad which is what I've mostly used here but you can also look at them as they were collected a lot of the 18th century late 17th century collectors of ballads whose collections are the main ways that these ballads survived right because they were so ephemeral if people are using them for toilet paper they're not getting saved but there were a few collectors who collected them but they had their own visual preferences. And many of them cut off the edges to paste them into books. They wanted their books to all be the same size. They did all these things and they sorted and cataloged them too. So a whole other layer that I, that I could have, and maybe if I keep working on this idea that I might looked at is how the ballad collectors themselves pre-modern thought of the ballads as associative. So if you look at the categories that peeps you know, he has like tables of contents for the collections of the ballads that he has. And he'll call them like love, pleasant, love, unpleasant, love, you know, uh, whatever. How, what's the difference between love, pleasant and love, unpleasant? Peeps himself had a lot of weird ideas about love and sex that might be considered queer. And so noticing which ballads the collectors were interested in and how they frame them in relationship to one another could be another way of tracing these sort of connections and associations. The other, as I was kind of gesturing at before, is I really didn't look too closely for this project at who's printing which of these ballads. And so with something like this would cut from sport upon sport, is this just at the top drawer of a printer who, who likes the shape of it, right? And he's gonna use it as he's setting a lot of ballads or are we seeing it across multiple printers or publishers because it is doing this other kind of work. So those are great directions I could look at uh, as I continue kind of uh, noodling through this idea. The, a question from Peter uh, Cadillac, did you want to ask that or? Yeah, Peter, because of my many technical fails, I cannot read so? the chat. So either Ben will have to read it or you could voice Did it. you want to read that or um, should I just read that? Uh, anyway, it says great talk. Do we know uh, do we know who was the consumer audience ratio of literate to versus illiterate? Uh, where were they read in a pub or in the privacy of home? Also, do we know anything about acceptance by authority? Also, you mentioned body woodcuts, or is that body <laughs> cuts? Is that an academic term? Yeah, okay, so many good questions. So to the question of audience, one reason that ballads as literary objects have had a real resurgence of interest in the last, you know, dozen years or so is because they really are the closest thing we have to a universal popular culture, maybe alongside the theater. Um, and they, we know that they were purchased, they were affordable and they were purchased from by, by people of all social standings and that they were at both private, as you say, somebody might read this privately, particularly if it ended up in their bathroom and they're tearing it up uh, to use in that way, but also publicly they were used decoratively. And in fact, a lot of the early scholarship about the woodcut images was mostly about just how it created an aesthetic artifact that could be displayed on the wall of a public gathering space like an alehouse or in a private home. Uh, and so we know that they were used that way. 
In terms of literacy, it's really interesting to think about. First of all, because of what Ben was saying earlier about how the ballads were sung in the streets, it's possible that even non-literate audiences would have been familiar with the language of the ballads from hearing it sung by the hawkers or hearing it sung in a communal space. So they might've memorized it or memorized the lyrics to one version and been able to understand then that they were looking at an adaptation. Um, and also there was mixed literacy during this period. And so um, there is some scholarship that says there might've been a lot of people who could read but not write. And so these ballads might've been kind of at their level of literacy potentially. So they were fairly accessible. Um, to the question of the body, there are not too many overtly pornographic images that I'm aware of printed woodcut images printed together with ballads. I think something like this one with the couple embracing in a bed, a sort of suggestive image is about as racy as they get. There's some nudes, you know, women with their breasts showing things like that. And there were pornographic woodcuts available, especially on the continent during this period. So it could have been done and it wasn't done mo in most of the surviving ballads that I'm aware of. Um, but as I shared a little bit before I ran out of script today, the language was often extremely body and pornographic. And that pun that, that I don't know if it was suggested in the, in the question itself or just by Ben between body and the body is so one that the colors have done a lot with. It was in the question, yeah. yeah. And so I was saying body with a W, but it's true that it's also embodied or about bodies. And so um, I'd say both and in those contexts. So I'd say, based on my knowledge of pornography in the early modern period, these would have been some of the most racy, publicly widely available texts. Um, and they were sometimes censored, but not, not widely censored. Um, and so they would have been accessible in ways that other pornographic or erotic material might not have been to a wider range of audiences. So in looking for queer context, that's an exciting thing about these that, that not only are they providing sexual contact, but maybe non-normative sexual content to that kind of broad audience, potentially. Oh. Um, was there another question or should I keep going? Anybody else? Uh, he says, excellent, thanks. Oh, thank uh, you. I, I would have been more excellent if I could have read it to the end, but maybe this is an inspiration to be more extemporaneous. Yeah, well, I mean, when I see these prints or when I first started looking at them, they seemed to be this, um, the image giving some physicality to what was, was otherwise text. I mean, when it's performed by a live person, their body, they're there as a human being yeah. performing this. But when the person is gone, you have this, uh, the physicality of the image and with all its yeah. physical specificity. I mean, it's, right. it doesn't have specificity to people used to looking at photographs, but to somebody looking at another kind of visual um, right. uh, range of images. These are pictures. I mean, they're, as, right. and they, they're, they're as graphic as any image. They're just, they don't have this, the specificity of, I you know, modern photographs. But, uh, mm -hmm. but, you know, I think that separation of that happened in, in culture of text and image these yeah. were going again. These were trying to bring it together for people who needed the connection. They didn't right. want to just see the text. And I mean, there were a lot of ballad sheets that are not illustrated too. Sure, of course. I mean, uh, these are the- uh, No, I'm glad you said that. There's such an interesting paradox in what survives from the early modern period. So of course, mm -hmm the performances in early modern theater, which was also highly popular and highly accessible, were deeply embodied, right? So we know from people's writing a little bit about what it looked like to watch those bodies on the stage, but we don't have a ton of images, right? So that image yeah, that yeah. Laura McAllister uses, you know, this is not a very good image of what it would look like to see an actor on the stage, right? This, this little picture that she thinks might be a boy actor playing a woman, you know, this is, it's, it's not great, right? And we only have one image from someone who watched a Shakespeare play and tried to draw what it looked like, right? We don't have a ton of that, more from court masks. In contrast, 
the happenings in a ballad are mostly fictional, not about real embodied people, but we have all of this visual vocabulary about them, right? So it, it's an interesting paradox. And from, from my interests, there's this kind of interesting slippage where on the one hand, it's provocative to read fictional imaginings of queer gender and sexuality because everything's so possible, right? Like the, the scholar Sawyer Kemp, I'm looking at Corey in the audience because we've talked before about Kemp's work, does this interesting reading of Twelfth Night and of kind of trans performances of Shakespeare and says, why is it so easy, right? It's so different from live trans experience when a character just says, now I'll be a boy and then they are with no dysphoria and no trouble passing or whatever, right? Fiction allows that kind of thing. Um, but then at the same time, when I look at some of these warrior women ballads or other kinds of trans representation, I want to see some of that real embodiment, not just the fictional ease that comes with imagining gender transgression, but actual evidence of what that gender transgression might've looked like. So exactly what you're saying, that tension between wanting the detail of sort of a visual record and wanting to be able to um, have a broad queer imagination at the same time. And plus the, the images that are that the multiple images, they just set up a whole time system. That's yeah, I mean, very, very compelling. Yeah, you know, it's still about. We have, yeah, we have uh, to look at this, you know, with a pre cinema eye. Uh, yeah, but they do exciting. have plenty of comics or, you know, in that sort of sequential set of boxes to tell a story, whether you read it more in the kind of collage idea that I mentioned of Alexander Franklin, where like, you know, you're doing a kind of pastiche blending of these images, or in that other idea that these are sort of like mixable story parts and you put them in an order to tell a story. Um, I like both of those ideas and I think they're both available. Like I'm just looking at this one. This appears to be a person who's given birth, right? A woman maybe in, in a birthing bed, but we just read a whole ballad about how that person looked like a man giving birth on a battlefield, right? So, so why did the publisher decide to use this image? Is that meant to sort of normalize things? Is it just meant to mean like birth? <laughs> uh, is, it, is it not that and just some other kind of space filler? It's really interesting to kind of think through in each of the individual ballads. I think there's a lot of projection happening when you look at a picture, Absolutely. depending on what you know about. It. I mean, that's the whole way it, illustration works. You know? mm -hmm. And so, especially uh, if the illustrator is not in communication, right? So when you look at these purpose-made woodcuts, like the Lady in the Blackamoor that I showed you at the beginning, or this title page that I just flipped to of Mall Cut Purse, you can see that the illustrator is going out of their way to kind of hit the key points from the plot. But when you look at the more associative uses of woodcuts, it does lend more to the reader to make decisions about what they think they're seeing or what they want to be seeing. And that's where I kind of, was exploring that idea of passing or um, you know having mixed meanings depending on the on the audience, which I think is really evocative. You know that this could look, if you don't read the title, could look like just a war ballad. Maybe you buy it not realizing, right? Or if you're looking for that kind of queer masculinity, then you could say, oh my goodness, look at this. It's called the female warrior, but here are all these soldiers. And actually these soldiers remind me of those other masculine women I've been reading about in other print media. So I want this ballad for that reason, right? And those two audiences can both exist simultaneously. And then as you added, the hawker could be selling a whole bunch of these on a theme, or this could be mixed in with a whole other random association uh, assortment that creates other kinds of associations. You know, if it's right next to one about women criminals, maybe that heightens the idea that this is uh, illicit. You know, if it's next to romances, maybe this is sold as a love story that she would do this for her, for her lover, right? And, and again, the ballads are so short and missing so much in terms of plot that you can use the images to try to fill things in. Yeah, the, the Mayhew's description of uh, ba um, ballad performers or picture reciters is that they'd work one print or one board, mm -hmm. you know, uh, through their, their route around the city until it stopped drawing attention. Yeah. So they, they were, I don't know, 
that yeah, that they'd have uh, the people in the street would have a backlog of other prints to sell. They would have the printer yes, uh, pushing up. At least that's it's hard to say. I mean, that's, I didn't talk about tunes, right? So each of these yeah, is a, a tune, and that's a whole other kind of uh, rhizomatic web connecting the different ballads to one another. If they're sold to sung yeah. to the same tune, these were like you know earworms. Yeah. If someone's walking around your block singing the same song all day long, that song's going to be in your head for a long time, right? And then when you hear another so ballad, you might try singing it to that same tune, associating them, right? And so, um, you know, there's just so many ways that this was part of just an, a sort of cumulative, immersive popular culture. Um, and then again, I feel like that is part of what allows them to maybe carry this extra associative weight. I'm seeing that more chat bubbles are popping up, but I cannot see them. Yeah, uh, another message from Peter Cadillac. Uh, that coding works if these are hung on the wall in a pub. Those in the know will recognize queer friendly themes and anyone reading stories to illiterates could choose to edit out themes that might be seen as objectionable. Mm -hmm. thereby allowing the code to slip by unnoticed, uh, i.e. The, the vagaries of the images work both ways. I um, mean, yeah. yeah, it was a pretty, I mean, I don't know if the, even the idea of normative sex pre is something later. I mean, they well, think I'm, we're pretty I'm, strange. I'm this up, Peter, because you're making me wonder something I've never thought before about queer community in the pre-modern period. So to answer your point, Ben, the sort of party line that I was trained with as a historicist and that still is very much part of kind of queer historical work in the pre-modern period is that queer identities and the way we think of them now didn't exist in the early modern period. And the way I was trained was to say, you know, they didn't think of sexual identity as a fixed identity that was sort of a part of a, who a person was. They thought of it as, as a set of acts and that you sort of the act was a queer act, but that it didn't affect how the person identified. That was sort of the general understanding of how people talked about sexuality as more of a presentist myself, I've always said, well, sure, but they knew that there were certain kinds of people who habitually practiced these acts and that those habitual practicers of those acts had certain kinds of affectation, certain kinds of sociality, certain kinds of behaviors and appearances. And so I think it's sort of an artificial delineation between modernity and early modernity to pretend that there wasn't a kind of queer recognition and identity different from what we have now, but still one that existed. And so what I like about your question, Peter, is, is maybe it makes us extend that even further beyond just might there have been individuals who had certain habits that we would today identify as queer and who knew that about themselves and about one another to even might there have been a bar <laughs> that, you know, through the, the particular ballads that it hung up or the particular clientele that it attracted. Um, could have had that kind of a reputation. I have no idea, right? We don't have any evidence of that. Um, but my queer instinct says that we've always known how to find each other. And so maybe that's possible. Why not? Yeah. Some advisors of mine are like rolling over, over this, but I still think it's the case. Yeah. Was there another question in the chat? Oh, I think those were the last two there. Uh, and and how do the uh, the texts work? They go from a narrator to dialogue, or they or they all start in dialogue. And the oh, there's all different well, every ones. variation. Every yeah, variation. I picked mostly ones that are sort of the sex and romance ballads, or of course the warrior women ones, and those um, tend to tell a straightforward story, usually in a pretty standard verse. Um, one interesting thing that happened when we were working with uh, Diane Dugau's catalog of warrior women ballads is that she was trained as a folklorist. And so she divided them all based on the style of discourse. So there was like direct discourse, discussion, discourse, argumentative discourse. I can't remember all the correct folkloric terms, but that was how she separated the different ballads. Were they to a couple in a debate, discourse debate ballads? Was it an individual narrator? Was it in first person address? You know, these different, that was how she thought of them. Quite a lot of the sex and romance ones are some kind of 
dialogue between lovers you know one will say one thing the other will say another but I did notice as I was working on this presentation that most of these were kind of narrative storytelling either in the voice of one of the characters or from an omniscient narrator and I think only that one very pornographic one about the married couple was was dialogic with first the husband speaking and then the wife. I don't think there were others in this batch that were that way, but they come in all different forms. There are religious ones, political ones, news items, science ones, you know, so they're on, they're on every possible theme. Yeah. yeah there's a, I was just looking at the, the, the book, the, it's a German book they claim, it's a Swiss German book, they claim is the first illustrated book. It's the uh, the Jewel, I think it's called in English, mm -hmm. and uh, it's um, fables. And each fable has an illustration, but next to the illustration is the same figure, point gesturing to it. I like a hundred. Uh, there are a hundred pages it's like that where. A pointing figure drawn or also a wood so also it's a woodcut wood next to it in its own frame that's really and um it's just repeated a hundred times mm -hmm. like you you needed that i assume it's the the narrator pointing to the story right. and uh it's sort of an like an emblematic um depiction of the fable but yeah. uh you know, oh, I, I think, yeah, people I would look at these things. I would know more about the history of graphic design, but one thing that that's super interesting as you read through these, especially if you read them in a kind of chronological order, is watching just like the presentation of information evolve, right? So you talked about how there are lots of woodcuts without ballads. Early ballads are mostly in the landscape shape. They're mostly in black letter font. They mostly have this sort of like subtitle with some content. They look a lot like this one. The later ones are in the portrait mode, fewer woodcuts, more often an engraving of music, even if it's not the actual tune, just like a musical notation. They look more like maybe a modern newspaper, right? So you can also see style and taste and the way that people like to to receive information evolving over the course of the different ballads and that's really kind of cool and interesting it would be a great project for someone working in graphic design to look more at sort of the the um technical communication going on in the formatting of these ballads right like what looks tidy to people is it bigger images or smaller images or being right justified or less left justified or whatever all that kind of stuff uh, even just like the framings, the decorative aspects, I think that would be a cool project. Yeah. And so some of these run up until the 18th century or do these, are these all earlier ones? They run even into the 20th century. I mean, Diane Dugas project that I was oh. referring to earlier, she okay. even went to, to Appalachia and sat with folk singers and heard modern versions of some of the ballads that she could trace all the way back to, you know, England in the 17th century. And so, you know, they were kind of living as songs, but also printed in lots of different ways. The later ones, look more, you know, like I said, vertical, white letter font. Sometimes they're in like a compilation, almost looks like a newspaper with multiple columns with multiple ballads in them, but different print iterations of these ballad songs, including repurposings of the same songs over and over again, maybe updated in some minor way. Those continue all the way into the 20th century. Yeah. Be interesting to, um follow the um, the chronology as compared to the more, the prints made for a more affluent audience, you know, the Interesting. political yeah. prints that are parallel. But I don't know how, how carefully these were dated. Uh, or, no, or did, it's, very, did, it's very hard. If you look in, Eva, I've started actually on my, um, PowerPoint for today, I was putting dates, but they were all like between 1650 oh, yeah. and 1690. You know, it was, you can't really, in fact, I was thinking about trying to make a sequential argument about some of these couple on the bed ballads, but you really can't, or at least I can't. 
date yeah. them with enough accuracy to know which came first, which came second. There may be ways of doing it a little bit better. One thing that for sure is interesting is that this rich visual vocabulary where there's multiple woodcuts on most ballads definitely falls out of favor. So the later ones tend to have maybe a header image or something like that. But you can see to Peter's earlier question, a rise in a particular kind of literacy that isn't using the music and the the woodcut images as heavily in order to convey meaning, right? So people are becoming more literate in a strictly reading kind of way instead of literate in a way that includes the tune and the images as part of understanding the ballad. Or just the market has changed and people want it differently, both maybe. Yeah, I mean, the form, you see it parodied into Punch uh, magazine you oh, know, into sure. the nineteenth century, the ballad sheet. Yeah, so, uh, that's you know, and that, it didn't go away. And that, but but it, yeah, it's it, the upper class prints have very specific dates on them, mm -hmm. and you well, can so. Uh, yeah, and also most of these are anonymous. Both the the art, the woodcuts are anonymous, and the uh, the writing is anonymous. So you usually have the just only the printer's name, and sometimes variations on the same ballot are coming out from more than one printing house. So even that is sort of anonymous, and that has to do in part with their sort of being a lower art form that that sort of ownership was less the thing than just sales. Yeah. Um, and that's sort of similar, I think, to, to tabloid culture, too. I don't know that bylines are as much of a thing, right? So it's more about just getting the sensational news out there more than building a journalistic reputation in this case. Maybe I'm misspeaking about tabloids, but certainly it's the case about ballads. Yeah. Um, but I, I do think as they become more available, more searchable, as our own strategies for seeing them in clusters and categories continues to evolve through digitization. I mean, this tool through EBA where you can do a, a woodcut image search within the site and they on purpose made it so that it's not looking for exact matches, but for sort of like vibe matches, right? Like in the case of that devil image that I was talking about, it'll capture a devil that's different, right? Definitely from a different woodcut if it is sort of a similar devil with the same kind of imagery. And so that allows whole new connections that otherwise you would have had to sit in a physical archive and flip through these forever and maybe you'd catch it and maybe you wouldn't, right? So we're going to be able to make new kinds of connections about these. And so I think the main goal I had tonight was just to start thinking about what might come out of that, right? And I'm not saying these ideas are particularly the ones, but I do think we may find that certain kinds of images came to be associated with certain kinds of ideas. And as we recognize that, we can learn more about how those ideas functioned culturally and in society. And I think that's really exciting to imagine. Yeah. I think I was, I think there's a searchable edition online of Peep's diary. Mm. And I did a, a quick search to see if he spoke much about the, the prints yeah. that he picked up. But there, there isn't much. I don't, I don't think I, think I found much. First of all, Peep's diary is amazing. And I think yeah. there's one, not just the searchable one you mentioned, I think there's one where you get like a note every day, what he said on that day in history, you know, in his diary, because he was a wild thing, like talk about a weird life. But I think it was Peeps who said the thing that's now sort of famous about the um, the ephemerality and spread of ballads where he called them straws in the wind. Like he was collecting them and he was like, they're just everywhere. You know, you can't even catch them all. And that's why he undertook this project of trying to find a lot of them and trying to organize them in these many volumes that he created. So uh, Peeps' collection is one of the larger extant collections of ballads. Um, but any, any scholar, a generation above me who worked on ballads will describe going to a library and saying like, do you have any ballads? And someone would, would direct them to like an unnamed box sitting under a staircase somewhere. And they would just open it, it'd be full of these unsorted, aging pieces of paper, you know, and, try, and trying to sort of make order of those before digitization made them more available because they were so fragile that libraries either didn't deal with sorting them or didn't want people to come look at them. And so 
even though they're very old texts, their wide availability now is, is new because of digitization and now these sort of different kinds of virtual cataloging and searchability. Yeah, they're so they're great. old and they're new. Yeah. One of the great uh, technological inventions, I guess. Yeah, well, new I don't want to put too much credo, credence into technological inventions now that it failed me and I had to improvise the end of the oh, talk. Yeah. But, but it's true. And I hope that some of you will um, will look through the English Broadside Ballad Archive or the Warrior Women Project and take a look at those ballads and send me notes. I would put my email in the chat, but. Uh, yeah. My chat's not working. I have it on this front page here. Um, I'd love to hear from anyone thoughts um, afterwards about the talk or ideas you have about ballads and pre-modern queer culture. So be in touch, please. And Ben, thank you so much for your good questions and your patience as everything fell apart for me and, uh, and for giving me this opportunity to think about new stuff. Thank you, it was great. Yeah. Amazing stuff, amazing uh, discoveries. Right, it's just all there and nobody's talking about it yet. So come join me and do it. Huh. Love to see okay. some modern ballads Anybody from- Anybody else? So this, I think this is, yeah, this is our last lecture for this um, season or semester, but it will start up again in um, August, end of August um, with a new series um, sort of organized by Austin English. I'm taking a real sabbatical so i'll be congratulations away for a while but uh, it will continue and uh yeah we have to do more ballad let's do uh, more ballads. ballad sheets because maybe i'll come back with the second half of my paper and yeah yeah <laughs> figure it all yeah it's um watching looking at a lot of them it's great to watch the uh decay of images and oh yeah how they still so were had some meaning, some very magical meaning to people. These they were old. I mean, people, images were in circulation for. I mean, and you can watch them your decades or hundreds of years. Yeah, starts pooling. They get these worm holes in them, yeah. you know, and then they start chopping them up using the parts that still work. So it's really um, amazing to watch. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, thank you so much for hey, having me. Thank you, everybody. Staying up late on and, a Tuesday with me. Yeah, and thanks for coming, and thanks for the great talk, and we'll be in touch. Okay, great. Take care. Uh, I'm going to try to close my computer now. We'll yeah. see. <laughs> good night, All right, everybody. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye.